the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I had another Star Wars illustration for all of you, which I know is what you've been looking forward to, uh, but I couldn't figure out how to use it without spoiling part of the movie, uh, so uh, it, it's on the uh, cutting room floor. Uh, but I did want to go back to where we started this journey, even before we got to Advent, the Sunday before Advent. Uh, the question that I posed was, who is the God that we're waiting for? Who is the God that we expect to see? Is it the God that intervenes uh, and is always moving us out of uh, danger's way? Or is it the God that gives us the freedom uh, but is tethered to us with such love and investment that even in our fallings, even in our injury, our illness, uh, our doubts, uh, that God loves us and grieves with us and is, is present with us? Uh, is it the God of, of justice with sharp teeth? Uh, or is it the God of, of compassion who understands all of the complexities of all of our lives and, and understands our imperfections uh, and meets us right where we are? Uh, or is it the God that is trying to kick us in the tail a little bit and move us to someplace new? Um, now I think one of the more appropriate questions is not just who is the God that we expect to see, but how wide open are we uh, to a God that is outside our expectations? Take the Advent story. I think uh, the story of God is a story of a God who is always outside our expectations. Start with that uh, story uh, from Samuel of David. Now remember, uh, the Jewish people wanted a king. All the great, great nations had a king, and they didn't have a king. They had judges that were sort of intermediaries between God and God's people. Uh, and they were doing quite well, but they looked at all these countries with mighty kings, and they said, we want kings. That's what all the great countries have. And God kind of warned them and said, you know, you have a king, and that, mean, that means your sons will be in their army fighting. Uh, it means uh, uh, your daughters will be part of their concubines. Uh, you know, be careful what you ask for. But they said, all the great nations have kings. We want a king. So he finally acquiesced, and they picked their king, and uh, he was the tallest, biggest, strongest, most king-looking king they could possibly find, uh, and he was a pretty mediocre king. King Saul. Uh, and so then God says, I'm going to pick the next king. I acquiesce on this whole king thing, but I get to pick the next one. And remember, he goes and he visits all of Jesse's, uh, and he sends uh, uh, his judge uh, to go, and, and uh, Samuel to go and uh, pick from all of Jesse's boys. And they line up all the boys from, uh, from oldest and tallest on down, uh, and, uh, and, and he goes to all of them, and he says, there's got to be another. There's, none of these are the ones that God has called. And they find this uh, ruddy young boy who's been tending his sheep, um, who doesn't have any of the characteristics that they anticipated, and they said, that's the one. And then he goes and he slays Goliath and he becomes a great king. But what happens, which is something that we all, if we're honest with ourselves, are susceptible to, when he becomes a great king, uh, he also becomes very comfortable. And he's living in a nice palace, uh, and he looks out the window, and he sees uh, all of his people down below, and he also all of a sudden realizes that God is still, the God that uh, uh, made him king, the God that has delivered his people, uh, is still hanging out in the little tabernacle that traveled in the wilderness for those 40 years uh, in the wilderness, that the Ten Commandments uh, and all other relics are still uh, down in that tabernacle while he's enjoying all of the comforts of the kingship that God provided him. And so uh, he gets a brilliant idea. I'd feel a lot better in my heart about who I am and the way that I'm living uh, if I built a giant palace for God. And so he changes uh, uh, the nature of God, or at least he tries to, uh, by building an equally big house so he feels good about what his life looks like. And how often do we do that? How often do we construct the God that we want, uh, uh, the God that condones our lives, the God that uh, meets us exactly where we want God to meet us, uh, instead of the God that is always exceeding or outside our expectations. And so God says, no, not now. I'm the God that has always been with my people, the God that has always uh, traveled and, uh, and been on the ground uh, with God's people. And I want you to always remember that that's the God that I am. And so David's challenged. And one of the most brilliant things about the story that we've been waiting for, the story that we've been unfolding, uh, is that uh, God 
comes into the world, breaks into the world so far outside our expectations. And as we are here on Christmas Eve, on for Advent, uh, our anticipation giving way uh, to God reigning in, uh, let's remind ourselves how God comes into the world. Now first, Matthew. Uh, Matthew has uh, what I've told the, the kids when I, I, I go into the third grade class, uh, or the eighth grade, has the longest uh, uh, entry of any uh, book, and almost anybody would lose interest. I mean, the first chapter of Matthew is so and so begets so and so begets so and so begets so and so begets so and so who is from the, the house of so and so begets so and so. And if you're still reading through all of those names, eventually uh, you get to the birth story. But it's it's an amazingly calculated uh, a construct. Uh, that Matthew wants us to know how critical it is uh, that Jesus came uh, from the stump of Jesse, from the family of David, uh, that, that the whole uh, prophecy of, uh, that the, the Jewish people were waiting for is realized in Jesus. And then the first people to come visit in Matthew's version are the wise men who have no Jewish blood in them whatsoever. That as important as it was uh, to the people listening, to the Jewish congregation listening, that God was doing something new and it was going to be broken open right away. The first people uh, came from halfway around the world. Uh, and that's how Matthew shows that Jesus is so far outside our expectations. But Luke does it even one better. Luke has Jesus come uh, not into a, a palace, uh, but to a peasant girl outside of marriage. A peasant girl with no significance whatsoever other than uh, a beautiful image of God. Redefining who God is in that moment. And the first people to come uh, uh, are the shepherds. And where does he come? To the, uh, to the uh, 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 beautiful hospital bed just constructed? No, to a manger uh, inside a stable turning that story upside down, taking our expectations of who God is and how God will meet us and just absolutely dumping them upside down. So I encourage you, as we open our eyes wide, to ask ourselves, are they wide enough for God? Is God coming outside our expectations and are we open enough for a God that challenges us, not to, uh, not to fit conveniently within our own construct, but to ask something more of us. To ask us to move our lives a little bit more towards that light. So as we hold that truth that is so true and so pregnant in this moment that a light comes into the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it, are we brave enough, are we open enough to move towards the light, to shift our lives towards God?